meeting is being recorded. Okay, so hello, my name is Matt Hamilton. I'm from the Compose team at uh, IBM. So Compose, for those people, this may seem strange to those in the room, but uh, for those that are not in the room, um, Compose do databases uh, in the cloud for IBM. And so, yeah, I'm gonna do a talk on machine learning and AI. This is actually not directly related to what I work on in a day-to-day in -day job. I'm by no means a AI guru or machine learning expert or anything like that. Quite the contrary. The entire point of this talk is to kind of talk about some of the things that I wish I knew when I started. The terminology that had I known would have made it much easier to search for what I needed to know. So I started sort of playing around with machine learning and playing around with AI and all of the terminology was completely alien to me. I uh, couldn't work out what it was I was actually looking for. I couldn't describe the problem that I was trying to solve in order to find help to solve it. So the idea of this talk is to uh, give people hopefully a little bit of information and, and just sort of basic grounding in some of the sort of terminology around machine learning and demystify it a little bit. He says, hoping that the remote will let me actually For some reason, my remote is not letting me uh, change screen. One second. Ah, there we go, there we go. So the first thing to start with is what's the difference between machine learning and AI? And this is where I probably annoy a lot of people within the AI and machine learning teams within, within IBM because I've got a slightly flippant response, which is in short, if you're reading a PowerPoint, it's AI. If you're in Python, it's machine learning. Now, yes, that is a flippant answer. Uh, artificial intelligence is a much broader topic uh, than, than just machine learning. And there's a lot more technologies you can use uh, besides Python. My experience is in Python, that's why I'm using Python, but people use R, SPSS, there's various other tools as well uh, for doing machine learning stuff. But really the, the, the point being is that when people talk about AI, a lot of it really does boil down in, in, in essence, in most cases, down to multiplying a couple of matrices of numbers together it's, and, and just doing that over and over and over again. Uh, so what is quite an expansive topic actually boils down to some actually quite simple concepts. Now in this talk, I'm going to introduce some of them. I'm not going to go deep down into the maths of how all of it works, partly because one, I only have a superficial understanding of it, but two, that's not really the, 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 the point of this talk. Machine learning, boiling it right down, all machine learning does, a machine learning algorithm does, is it's a function that takes an input and gives you an output. So for example here, you can have a function f of x uh, that you could write and you could write it and you could say, okay, just return x plus one. So uh, if, if you gave it one, it'd give you two, you give it three, it gives you four, et cetera, et cetera. You give it six, it would give you seven. Now that's fine if you can actually write that equation. You can actually write how you're going to map the inputs to the outputs. But often you don't actually know what that mapping is. You don't know how to map from the input to the output. And so you're trying to do something a little more potentially complicated. One of the big areas for machine learning, as you're probably all aware, is image recognition. You know, we use it almost daily now on mobile phones and things like that. And uh, IBM, obviously, with Watson, there's a lot that Watson does with uh, image recognition, for example. So you have a function in which you pass in a, a, a image of a cat. And at the end of the day, this is just pixels. This is just values. This is a grid of values um, that you're passing that represent red, green, and blue pixel color. And at the end of it, you want the function, the, the input to be the, the, the set of pixels for a cat and the output to say, that's a cat. And similarly, you pass it pixels that represent a dog and you want it to say dog. So how would you code that function in the middle? Well, in traditional means, that would be near, near impossible. You know, you wouldn't sit down there and say, okay, let's iterate through the, through the pixels, and if the third pixel looks like this, and that's possibly an ear, bum, 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 bum. Um, <laughs> that would be, that'd be you know, a ludicrous uh, job. So the idea of machine learning is to learn what that function is. 
And there's several types of machine learning. There's several ways to do this. And I've, I've broken down three of the more common uh, mechanisms, uh, supervised <laughs> learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Again, there are others. These are the three that I've come across the most and, and the three that will probably uh, you, you could solve a large number of problems with, with one, of these, one of these three. So supervised learning. This is what a, a, a lot of people's sort of first introduction to machine learning is, is, is about. And you try and train the algorithm with known data, and then you ask it to predict the unknown. So right at the start, I had that example there. Now, if I gave it uh, an input of one, and I said the output is two, I give the input of three, the output is four, et cetera, et cetera, and repeat that enough times, it should learn that what I want to do is I want to get n plus one in my output. And within that, we can break it down into two different types as well. We can talk about classification, and we can talk about regression. Classification is trying to uh, determine uh, what class a input falls into. So I showed you the cats and the, the cat and the dog. So you could have you could generate a problem um, or, or, or in which you you know that the image is a cat or a dog, and you just want to know which one it is. And maybe you, maybe you actually want a bit of uh, confidence value there. So it actually comes back and it says, well, it's ninety five percent a dog. It's five percent chance that, the, that it's a cat. And what you do is you feed it 100 pictures of cats, 100 pictures of dogs, and then you can give it an unknown cat or dog, and it should be able to work out which one it is. You probably need more than 100. Um, one of the big things with machine learning is the more data you can give it, the better, generally. Um, the, the, the more examples it can learn from, the better it can try and uh, learn from. But there are, there are some caveats that I'll, I'll get into. And this is what things like, um, uh, so IBM with Watson Image Recognizer, and that's a, a sort of software as a service image recognition service that's really dead simple. You can create a zip file with a whole load of images of dogs, a zip file with a whole load of images and cats, upload those two zip files through the web interface, let it churn for a little bit, and it'll come back with a trained model. Uh, the model is the bit in the middle. When they refer to model, that's the, the uh, learned bit in the middle. And... Uh, then you can give it an unknown one and it will come back with, a, with a, an answer, you know, whether that's a cat or a dog or a, a percentage uh, guess as to which it is. And there's also within, say, within, within what's an image recognition, there's also pre-trained classifiers already there. So there's standard classifiers in which you could just upload an image and goes, yeah, that's a bicycle or, or that's a tent or that's a, a, a person with a beard or whatever it might be. Um, so there, there are pre-existing ones you can, you can use there. You don't necessarily have to train them yourself. Regression, as opposed to classification, regression is when you're trying to predict a particular value, often, say, a floating point value. You're trying to predict, so in this example, so given the historical temperature data for Bristol, what would the temperature be like tomorrow? And, 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 the, and the, answer, you know, the answer we're looking for from this is 4.5 degrees or you know, 23.1 degrees or something like that. Uh, we're not, we don't have a class, we're, we're trying to predict a particular value. And as I'll, as I'll show later, these things can be used, uh, you could solve the same problem. Depending on how you phrase the problem, you can use uh, either one of these in certain circumstances, which gets onto the bigger problem of, of trying to frame the problem you're trying to solve. Unsupervised learning. Uh, with supervised learning, I just showed, you give it a bunch of examples, you get it to learn from the examples. Unsupervised learning, you don't necessarily have examples. So things like clustering. So given a map, find all the towns of this, on this map uh, of mobile phone towers. So given, given a map that has a bunch of mobile phone towers marked on it, could you tell me where the towns are? And, and, and it might be able to learn that from partly from supervised learning because you might have given it, shown it where, where things are, but actually probably from clustering and then it can say, okay, well, given this arrangement of towers, we know that there's likely to be a town there. And things like association. So what other alerts do we get when we get disk full alert? So if we, if we put this on some monitoring system of one of our systems, uh, you could get it to try and learn associations. Also used in things like retail, you know, people who bought shoes also bought socks or, or whatever. There's, there's not a distinct thing you're, you're, you're giving it as examples, but you're getting it to learn patterns within, within the data and associate them. The third one I'm going to mention is reinforcement learning. And this, this one's quite fun. This is uh, learning by sort of doing or playing. 
And so you don't actually define a, a, a set of rules as such. What you define is an environment that, the, that an agent is going to work within. The agent takes some action on the environment and gets a reward and a state back. So in the example of the Atari breakout game, a classic game where you've got to bounce a ball up and down to destroy the blocks. You've got a paddle at the bottom. You can't quite see it on this screen, but there's a paddle at the bottom, and you've got controls to move left or right. So in this example, the machine learning algorithm knows nothing about the rules of breakout. It doesn't know how to play it. It doesn't even know, really, that it's what, it, what it's playing. All it knows is there's an environment, which is a set of pixels. There's a reward, which is the score. And there's some actions, left and right. And it learns by doing. So it starts going left, starts going right as the ball bounces. And it looks at the pixels and goes, OK, well, we've worked out that if the pixels are in this particular formation, then we should do this particular action in order to increase our reward. And over a number of iterations, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of iterations, uh, it will eventually learn how to play the game. And then what's quite interesting is taking things like that and applying them to different games, transfer learning, which is where you take what you've learned from one problem and try and apply it to another. We've learned some things about breakout. Could we also use that to play Pong, for example? You know, we've got a left and a right and a paddle we're moving. You know, can, can we learn from one and, and pass it on to the other? Uh, so again, this one, you don't have uh, data that you are sort of teaching explicitly, but you're, you're, you're trying to get it to uh, learn how to maximize a reward. And the trick with this is trying to work out what is the reward. In this case, it's obvious. It's, it's the, uh, the, the score you're, you're playing in the game. That's what you're trying to maximize. But you could imagine applying this to something like a, a, uh, a stock trading algorithm, in which you define the game as uh, uh, inputs here, pixels as being uh, data about stocks, say charts and information like that, that it looks at. And the reward might be how much profit you're making. Uh, but the reward also, a better reward, might be to minimize the amount of volatility, for example, minimize the risk. So there's, there's, there's a, a, a kind of a skill there in learning what the reward function should be. And sometimes with a lot of this machine learning, this is where you get some interesting results um, when, you, when you mess up, uh, when you accidentally get it to learn something that it's not meant to learn. You accidentally include a little bit of information in uh, that it shouldn't necessarily know about, and it starts to learn from there. So one of the, one of the examples was somebody was using um, machine learning to try and analyze medical photos, to analyze which photos had a, uh, a tumor. I can't remember which organ it was, but they were analyzing pictures of brains, for example. And they were trying to find out, OK, can a machine learning algorithm work out which of these x-rays of a brain has a tumor? And it started to learn it, and it got very, very good at it. And then they realized, that actually, what it was learning was the placement of the ruler that the, the, the medical professional had put on the image for scale so you could see the size of the tumor. So it wasn't learning the tumor. It was learning that there was a ruler there and the placement of the ruler. So, so you know, that's, that's the thing you've got to be very careful of. And, um, you know, you, you, you do something, so you think, wow, this is, this is fantastic. It's 99% it's accurate. That's normally a, normally a clue that you've got it wrong. You've normally accidentally put something in that, it's, that, it's, uh, that, it, that it shouldn't necessarily know about. So you've got some variable in your input and your output that are, that are correlated in such a way that, that maybe wouldn't be in the real world. So types of machine learning algorithms. There's various different types. Um, there's one such as, and, and again, this is just a sample of some of them, uh, neural networks at the bottom is what kind of a lot of people think about with machine learning because that's the kind of the, 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 the big hot new <coughs> sort of one in which a lot of work is done in. But there's a lot of others. So uh, Bayesian classifiers work on probability. So what is the probability of a cat given a cat and a dog and, 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 the, and the overall probability of a dog, for example? So that's used in things like um, spam detection. So when you, when you have a, a spam detector, something like Spam Assassin or something like that that detects uh, spam in emails, what it does is, is look and say, OK, uh, how many times does the word Viagra appear in this email versus the word Viagra appear in all emails, for example? Uh, and that's so naive based classifier works on probabilities. You have things like support vector machines. Uh, if you were to plot everything, uh, if you were to plot the characteristics of a cat and a dog, 
on some chart, imagine you had some axes in which you could define dog-like and cat-like, then the, the, the purpose of a sport vector machine is to try and find some plane. Uh, again, this is going to be, you know, it's represented as two-dimensional space there, but think about it, this could be multi-multi-multi-dimensional space, in which you're trying to find some sort of plane that can cut through that and say, okay, everything this side of the plane is a cat, everything this side is a dog. And so it tries to, to learn that. Random forest, uh, you basically have a decision tree and it takes a bunch of uh, routes down the decision tree and then works out what the probability is of that route being successful, multiplies probabilities back and works out what's what. A neural networks, like I said, this is the, uh, the, the one that a lot of people are kind of think of when they think of machine learning and, and, and AI. And this is trying to simulate how our, our brains work. You have multiple layers of neurons. You'll have an input layer, multiple hidden layers, and an output layer. And data gets passed, values get passed from one to another, and each one, there's a slight, there's a, um, a value uh, in there, a weight value, that the input gets multiplied at before it goes to the output. And the idea is that all of those values, the weight values, get tuned as you, um, as you train your data. So you pass lots of data through, and uh, it learns what the weights of those neurons should be. And it uses a system called backpropagation in most cases. So uh, an example of this is if I'm trying to, uh, uh, an analogy is if I'm trying to throw a, a, a dart at a dartboard and I hit to the right of the dartboard and kind of there's a feedback loop and I think, okay, I need to sell it, aim slightly further to the left in order to hit the, the center. Uh, and that's what happens with um, neural networks. So when the value comes out, you pass a value through, the weights initially are random, they come out at the other end, and it says, okay, well, uh, our error rate is, is this, and we need to change the values to reduce the, the error. So our error of classifying a dog, and over time we try and reduce that, that error down. An example to show kind of how, how simple some of this can be, uh, this is a very simple neural network on just a single slide using a fairly high-level Python API called Keras. And uh, at the top, I'm just importing a bunch of the libraries. Uh, I'm defining our data here. So this is the, uh, similar to the example I gave at the start, in which uh, my inputs here, x, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 10. And my y's are basically that multiplied by 2. We can look at that fairly intuitively, and we can see that, you know, the, the, the values there, the relationship between the values. Uh, we can define a model and we can add the layers in. So we can add a dense layer, which is the, the, the layer in the middle with five neurons and an output layer that has one neuron. So there's one value we, we're getting out. We can compile the model. We can train the model, which is where we, we call it model.fit and we pass it in a bunch of data. So I'm going to pass in the first uh, eight values there. And then I'm going to predict the, uh, the, the next, the last two. So after 7,000 epochs, an epoch is one iteration, generally one iteration through the entire data. So 7,000 attempts at going through all of that, that data. Um, I, I'm then going to try a prediction. I'm going to predict, okay, what are the last two numbers? So I trained it on from zero to eight. And then in the end, to test it, I'm passing it nine and 10 to see what we get. And out the, out the end, we get 18 and 20. Um, you know, you can, you can run this yourself. You, you, you may get 18, 20, you might get 18.000001 or something um, because it's dealing with, dealing with floats. And again, it's, it has no real notion that that's the next value. It's just thinking, okay, so based upon our data, what, what do we think it's going to be? So that's how simple it can be for certain, for quite simple things. You can actually get started with machine learning fairly simply um, if, if you're a Python developer here making that assumption, other toolkits have the same thing. Um, and I'll talk about some of the web-based systems later as well. Uh, common issues, uh, starting with machine learning. How do you frame the problem? So is it a classification problem? Is it a regression problem? What do I actually want to know? Anyway, so what is the percentage chance of rain tomorrow is regression. I'm hoping to get an answer back that says it's, there's a 23% chance of rain tomorrow, for example. 
But what I could say is, is there a greater than 60% chance of rain tomorrow? And that's classification, because I'm asking for yet, uh, the answer I'm wanting is yes or no. So I've kind of put a, a stake in the ground there, and I've said, okay, anything above that's an, a, a yes, anything below that's a no. Uh, so, so that same problem could be deemed either a regression problem or a classification problem, depending on exactly what you want to know. So do you actually want to know what the percentage of chance of rain tomorrow is? Or do you just want to know, do I need to bring an umbrella? Right? And so you can frame things in a slightly different way, depending upon what it is uh, you're, you're trying to solve. And another example is, again, talking about um, one, one of my interests is algorithmic uh, trading on foreign exchange and cryptocurrencies. So what do I want to know? Do I, if I can predict what the future price of a, of, a, of a share or a cryptocurrency is, then I can make a trading decision. Do I need to know what the future price is, or do I just need to know whether it's going to go up or down? So I can actually frame it as a regression problem or a classification problem. I can frame it as a reinforcement learning uh, problem as well by playing it, like I said, described earlier, as a game, and getting some agent to uh, effectively trade over past data and try and learn, okay, here's where we buy, here's where we sell. And I don't actually give it the rules as to when to buy or sell. It just has to learn when's, when's the best time to maximize profit. Pre-processing data. Much of machine learning is actually in pre-processing data and getting the data in a good shape. So much like when people talk about uh, decorating and talking about painting a wall or a car or something like that, most of the work is in the preparation at the start, preparing the surface, putting down a, a, um, you know, a base coat or whatever it is, a primer. It's, it's, it's similar with machine learning. Uh, if you were to take, say, the shares, uh, the share price of... Um, I don't even remember what that is, Amazon, Google, something like that. Um, if you were to try and predict over, say, the first few years, uh, just raw data, then your values you're taking are between, say, naught and 400. Well, that's great, but then the machine learning algorithm is going to get a bit confused later on in, in, in life when it tries to predict the value who's, that's, that's gone completely beyond the bounds of what it knows. Uh, so one of, the, one of the key things you can do is called making the data stationary, in which you take, say, the diff of each point. So this graph here is just what is the change between subsequent days. Uh, so by doing that, it then makes the data uh, easier for the machine learning algorithms to process, makes them more uh, generalizable uh, to use as well. Again, a similar, another uh, technique is detrending the data. Sometimes data has a natural trend. So if you've got a stock price that's going up like that and you try to get a machine learning algorithm to, to, to learn that, then you know, it might come back and say, well, my best guess is it's going to go up because that's what it's done all this time. Now, that doesn't actually learn any of the specifics about the data. That just is taking a wild guess. My, the probability is it's going to go up. So you can detrend the data. There's a package called SciPy. Uh, and you can detrend it. And so basically, the start and the end of that is, is, is about the same. And, and you can then teach your data that, uh, and it, uh, teach your machine learning algorithm based on that data. And then you can invert the data at the end when you actually run it. Similarly, unbalanced sets for classification. We're trying to learn what's a dog and what's a cat. If we gave it three examples of cats and two examples of dogs, then one, it's probably going to have a better understanding of what a dog is because it's seen more examples. But two, it might just go, you know what? It's probably a dog. Because, you know, <laughs> as far as it's concerned in its world, most things are dogs. So that doesn't really, really, you know, you, you get some false expectations there. Um, and one, one of, the, one of the, the key things you need to do with machine learning is try to validate the data, or validate the, the, the model on unseen data. So take a certain part of your data, say your first 75% to train it, and then use your last 25% or 80, 20, 90, 10, whatever, um, split and use your last bit to actually validate, does the model work on data it's not seen before? And for things like sets, there's, you, you can just randomly pick three dogs and go, okay, we do three cats and three dogs. Uh, there's, there's techniques to um, artificially uh, sort of expand sets. Um, you can, you can do things like, if you, literally, if you're dealing with images, um, skew the cat, rotate the cat. If I put a cat upside down, it's still a cat, 
right? So, so why don't I pass that into my machine learning algorithm, an upside down cat? Because what I need it to learn is what does a cat look like, not is a cat sat the right way up or, or upside down. Uh, and you, you can actually, by doing this, um, you can improve the generalizability of your machine learning algorithm. Because one of the biggest problems you get is a, is a problem called overfitting. And that is, if I was to teach a machine learning algorithm based upon a whole set of samples that had one very thing in, in, in particular, it wouldn't be able to generalize when that thing is missing. So if I trained it on a whole bunch of faces and those faces all happened um, to be white, and you go and try it on somebody you know, who's with a darker skin tone, skin tone then it might go, I, I, I don't understand what this is, right? So if instead you actually um, converted all the images to black and white or ran some kind of um, process, first of all, to um, normalize the colors, it doesn't matter if the image looks strange. It's, it's a machine learning algorithm is just going to be looking at ones and, well, not ones and zeros, floats between zero and one. So you take your, you take your cat, you rotate it a bit, you squish it, you... you, you um, uh, you manipulate it and, and corrupt it in various sort of subtle ways that gives it more of a, an idea as what are the important features to be looking for. Not just is there an ear in that exact location, but this is what an ear generally looks like. And you can do that in general with, with, uh, with data. You can introduce noise. Introducing a small amount of noise into the data can do, can do a similar thing. A small bit of uh, Gaussian noise into the data can help. Uh, feature engineering. So this is using uh, domain knowledge to add some meaning to the algorithm. The, al the algorithm is, is naive. The algorithm knows nothing about whether that is a cat or a dog. It just knows it's a set of pixels. So uh, there's been a machine learning challenge in IBM uh, that's just started recently. And uh, one of the, the, the first topics was trying to the survivorship of people on the Titanic. So given, given the passenger data, when the ship sunk, certain people survived, certain people didn't. Can you predict based upon their name, age, uh, um, sex, uh, cabin, uh, fare, price, etc., etc.? Can you can you work out whether they survived or not? Now, you can you can just pass that data in naively and try to get a machine learning algorithm to learn. But there's certain things we know as as humans that we can help it with. So, for example. Uh, looking at the titles, so whether Mr. Mrs. Well, there's Mademoiselle. Well, Mademoiselle, we know we know is Miss in, in in French. So rather than two separate categories that we're training on, Mademoiselle and Miss, we can say, well, they're the same thing. Um, uh, exactly, Madam and, and Mrs. There's a whole load of um, special titles there. So Countess, Captain. Um, Junkier, which I think is Dutch for somebody quite high up. Um, well, we can, we can make an inference that they're kind of they're kind of special. The chances are they're they're you know nobility or whatever. So, if a ship is going to sink and you've got you know a king on board, you can you can probably make an educated guess that they might try and save the king, right? So, so we can we can sort of take those those titles and say, well, we can infer something by what we know about them. They they all have a certain status and class that may have affected their, their rescue on, on the ship. Um, the, the cabin, so what do we know about the cabin layout? That's the, the, the deck layout on the right there um, of all the different decks. And so if somebody was in cabin A14, can we infer something from that? Well, A is deck A, and deck A only had first class passengers on. So if we know they're A14, again, we can infer that that might have, have helped them. Um, as, as, it, as it goes, to spoiler alert here slightly, um, that didn't actually make that much difference. The, the, biggest, the biggest indicator as to whether or not somebody survived or not was actually the age and gender. And if you think about it, again, going back to what we know, women and children first. And that was, uh, and that was the biggest thing. Generally, if you were male and over about 15, tough luck. You, you, you basically didn't make it. Um, so if you, if you were female or under a certain age, then you had a much higher chance of winning. And so this is the thing that sometimes you've got to step back and go, okay, what do I know about the problem from a human perspective to try and aid a, a naive algorithm that is just multiplying numbers very fast. Uh, again, another example here, uh, each one of these squares here is actually representing uh, financial data 
on uh, a trading exchange, order book data. So the, the, the green parts there are offers to uh, buy a stock and the red are offers to sell. The blue dots that occasionally appear in the middle are the actual prices at which something did sell. So if you think of it as a, as a, as a market, you've got some people offering at some price, some people willing to buy at a certain price and you sort of somewhere uh, meet in the middle and the trade is made. And so going along the x-axis is, is time. So by formatting this data that we know kind of in this graphical representation, can we then apply an image recognition algorithm to it and, and try and get it to learn what the features are? So it might say that, okay, if we have a, a, a big drop, so on the second one along, there's this big drop at the bottom here, what does that mean? You know, can, can it learn from the shape of the images whether or not, um, well, in this example, whether I want to know whether or not the price is going to go up or down in the next time step. So after, after that, after you've, you, that's, say, 180 seconds, in the next second, what's the price going to do based upon that? And that's using what's called a convolutional neural network. Um, I didn't touch on the different types of neural network in here, but a convolutional neural network uh, basically takes a, a, a matrix and applies it over an image bit by bit, sliding across the image. And the idea is that it, it, it learns where the edges are in the, uh, in, in the uh, image. And from there, you kind of build up, you have multiple layers. And so the first image, the, the first layer might work out, okay, these are circles and squares and triangles. The second one might say, okay, well, these are ears and eyes. And then the, the next layer might go, well, you know, two ears and two eyes, and that's, that's an animal. And the next one above might say, well, that's a cat. So that's, that's where the deep comes from when they say, when they talk about deep learning, it's having these multiple layers and each one can learn something slightly more, um, a higher level ab abstract than the previous one. So in terms of toolkits, um, there's a, a, a number of them. Um, most of them are Python based here. So vaguely going from higher level to lower level, scikit-learn is a uh, very high level one that not only does neural networks, but does all the other sort of ones I mentioned before, random forest, uh, naive bays, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Keras, which is now actually part of TensorFlow, is a high level um, uh, library for neural networks. And that's what the example was I showed earlier. TensorFlow is a lower level version of that. Um, and Theano actually is, is also uh, can be used by Keras, I believe, or by TensorFlow. I can't remember which. Um, it's further down there. Uh, Torch is multiple language, but there's also there's PyTorch, which is the Python bindings for Torch. Cafe I've not I've not used, but is a is a, a another library there. So there's a number. If you see these words, these are kind of you know libraries that allow uh, machine learning models and train them and, and do predictions on them. IBM have a number of tools. Um, I haven't managed to keep up with all the different ones, but uh, under Watson Machine Learning, there's a, a whole series of web-based tools and APIs. Uh, Watson Studio is a online um, sort of web-based, uh, um, what is it, Jupyter notebook in, in, in Python that you can use. And uh, so you can write code there. There's various tools. This one you probably can't see, but that's, that's mapping out all the layers of a neural network, um, a, a very deep neural network there that's been sort of drawn out graphically within, uh, within uh, uh, Watson Studio uh, there. And like I said, there's tools that you can do things like upload a bunch of images and it will, it will train on them. There's APIs to access that. So you can write something in, in, uh, in Python or, or whatever and, and connect to Watson services and go, okay, tell me, tell me what this image is, or given this set of data, tell me what the next value should be. So that's it. Um, thank you very much. Hopefully that's a very, like I said, quick, high-level run-through of some of the terminology within machine learning and, and, and AI to hopefully give people a bit of a, an idea as to what the various bits are and how they, how they fit together. Cool. Any questions? Right. Yeah. Do you know? uh, so when you said you you train things with a large number of focuses, one thing, one not the other. Yeah. What happens if one of them 
accidentally contains images of the wrong thing. So does it become corrupted and you have to start over? Or? So if you're, if you're training, the question was, if you're training data and you, you accidentally uh, include a wrong image in a data set, does it corrupt it? Um, yes, to a degree it would do. If it was one image, it probably wouldn't. If you're training it on a thousand images of, of, of dogs or 10,000 images of dogs and one cat sneaks in, probably not going to be a problem. Um, but yes, that's where you can start getting, you know, sort of things in there that might uh, influence it. Um, if you accidentally left, a, say, a subtitle on the bottom of the image, a watermark or something that said this was from the, the um, you know, the, you took your images from the dog rescue center and the bottom of each image was a watermark of the dog rescue center logo, then it might start learning a dog is an image that has a dog rescue center logo in it, not a dog is, you know, sorry, with four paws and barks. So, yeah. So, question at the back? I was just going to say, um, in the world of nonlinear models, what can you best explain that? In the world of nonlinear models, how do you explain the technique back to businesses? Yeah. Yeah. So the, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So how how do you explain the results? Yeah. How do you explain the results you get back? It's it's really difficult, um, and that's one of the weirdest things when you start programming with machine learning because you can't reason with it so easily. You know, you're used to be able to looking at some code and saying, if this, then that, 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 that. And you can look through and run a, a, a debugger through and you can say, okay, the value is this at this point. With machine learning, you, you kind of go so far beyond that that you can't really do that. Um, and it gets kind of scary. Like I said, I've been writing things that algorithmically trade, buy and sell shares. And, and it goes, okay, why did you sell at that point? I don't know. Um, because at some point in time, it learned that that would be a good thing. Um, IBM has actually been working on some specific tools for doing that. And actually, there was a workshop um, uh, last night, a develop, IBM developer workshop, looking at uh, how to look at the, the, the fairness of models and bias and making sure you don't have bias in there and trying to explain the results. Because you, we get into a whole strange world where, okay, you've got two self-driving cars and one of them crashes into the other. Well, whose fault is it? How did they, why did they do what they did, why did one turn left, why did the other, you know, why did they run over that pedestrian? Um, and these are real world things. I mean, people may be aware there's a thing with, um, you know, a, a, a car that ran over a pedestrian. And they're trying to work out why, you know, why, why did it do that? Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's hard. There's, there's no straight answer to that, <laughs> basically. But that's the next kind of thing that I think people are looking at is how that fits in and fits in with the whole ethics and legal and regulatory world we, we live in. There's a bunch of algorithms in the scientific also that does linear regression some sort of conduct. So it's worth just Yeah, no, I, I, I kind of I know a bit about that. I mean just on the week of cross a lot in our field that, you know business business decisions need to be accurate. A linear model will get so accurate. Not linear model get more accurate but less explainable. So it's still you know, like say this yeah. No, ex exactly. It's it's difficult to uh, difficult to, to to get that you know to, to work that out. And you, you know, you somebody fills an insurance claim or something like that, and it comes back. Well, computer says no. Well, why? Well. How, how, how do you how do you then ex explain that necessarily? Just because the the data has learned from particular patterns that that claim may be fraudulent, but what is it that's what is it that's, that's made it think that? It's hard to explain. Yeah. So, okay. So, what are the applications of reinforcement learning other than gaming? Um, Things, well, game, when you say gaming, gaming can be applied to a wider thing. So, for example, things like self-driving cars. Um, if you try to get a car to, you know, learn how to drive down a road, I mean, you probably do this in a simulation than a real car, but you get it to drive down that road 100,000 times, and it gets a point for, you know, it gets points for how close it stays to the center of the road or how many pedestrians it doesn't run over, um, and, and, and tries to maximize that. You know, for example, that's that's a you know, how you, you could use reinforcement learning in that kind of scenario, because you don't have, you don't have a set of rules. You don't, you don't have a, a 
well, you do have some rules um, driving, you know, stay on the road, don't run over pedestrians, but you, you don't have a set of data for it to learn from exactly, <laughs> okay, the, given these inputs, that's what the output should be. So something like, you know, self-driving cars, um, I mentioned things like, you know, sort of trading or, or, or whatever. Um, we could do things with uh, alerts within, within our, our database clusters, for example. You know, you get it to, to, to learn, okay, given this sequence of events, what did the operator do at the end of it? And try and learn from there what, what happened and basically, you know, um, play a game of, um, you know, um, ops, you know, <laughs> you, you, you could form, format your problem as, as a game and then get it to basically play that game and try to learn how do you maximize the best, the best result. I love the thing like, uh, um, robots move in different directions and it's kind of It is. It, it, exactly, and, and reinforcement learning. One of the one of the, the games is that is often used is is a simulator of a like humanoid robot, and you give it a goal, and that goal is to get to the end, um, and you get it to then uh, learn what movement it has to do at each of its joints, its hip joint, its knee joint, its ankle joint, in order to you know propel itself forward to reach it. Again, an, another example of of how you can get unexpected um, outputs. So. There was a, um, I can't remember if it's a machine learning algorithm or, or genetic algorithm, but what, one of the two that the, the thing was to learn how to create some uh, evolved being very, 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 very tall and very thin and then just fall over <laughs> because the rule was only one part of it had to cross the finish line. Uh, not the whole thing. So I actually learned that if, if it just made itself really tall and then just fell over, that was actually the quickest way to get a part of it over the finish line. Uh, and so that's another example of, you know, the, these unexpected uh, unexpected things. And, and some of the gameplay ones are quite fun, actually. Some of the classic games, you end up these machine learning algorithms doing these really bizarre moves, you know, taking a race car round and round and round and round in circles because it works, but it can actually obliterate every other race car on the track by doing that continuously. And there's some bug in the game, which means it doesn't die because of something. So, you know, it learns, well, that's, that's the way to play the game. We just keep going round and round and, you know, destroy everything. Any other questions? Oh. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.